All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm excited to say that we have an, a great talk today by Marcus Maloney from the Coventry University about Manosphere. Uh, this is, of course, um, the second event in the New Media and Contemporary Culture series this semester. Um, the, uh, the other talk by Ruth Page from March is available on the official website. Uh, hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, in the classroom, and uh, online, yes, um, uh, uh, Marcus, uh, I think we're going to have a problem with capacity of this room now. Um, oh, hello. Great. Yeah. Well, not great for you, but great for me. Yeah, you can, uh, can sit over there and have the, and the side too. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Um, yes, um, cool. So, um, Marcus Maloney is an assistant professor of sociology at the Centre of Post-Digital post I'm sorry, post-digital cultures uh, at Coventry University. His research focuses on ideological contestation in digital spaces, men and masculinities online, video games, narratives, cultures and communities, and post-digital intimacies and socialities. Marcus has published widely in these areas, including articles in cultural sociology, new media and society, and games and culture. His most recent book, In Gender, Masculinity, uh, is Gender, Masculinity, and Video Gaming, Analyzing Reddit's r slash gaming community, uh, published uh, four, five years ago. Uh, by... ah, is that long ago? Jesus. Yeah. Are you, are you working on now, Marcus, on some book? Uh, no, papers at the moment. Uh, so my, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm basically going to go through what every, like every single aspect of what I'm doing now and how I got there. So, you know, um, right. I, I, I have, I have long form answers to all of those questions for you. Oh, great. Great. Marcus, thanks for accepting my, uh, my invitation, um, to give a talk. Thank you for giving it to me. And the floor is all yours. Ah, all right, here we go. Let me just share my screen. Um, uh, yep. Yeah, an absolute honor to get this invite hold on um oh no my uh okay there we go okay go away zoom thingy um all right here we are oh let me just uh reduce the the audio the uh camera windows or whatever uh put that up there so just let me know can you see all this all right uh, yes, I can. Can you see it from? Uh, yes, yes back, back there. Right, cool. Yeah. So we're. For yeah, yeah, cool. All right, I'll go. Um, I don't know if, if something, if there's some sort of technical thing or whatever. Just uh, I don't know, put something in chat or like shout out to me, Marcus. Something's gone wrong or whatever. Um, so yes, thank you for uh, having me. Uh, um, so the title of this, uh, well, as you know, or whatever, and as as uh, Bart's just said. The title of the talk is uh, Better Understanding uh, the Manosphere's Appeal Among Heterosexual, uh, cis Cisgender Heterosexual Boys and Men. Um, so, yeah, I'm Marcus Maloney, Assistant Professor of Sociology, yada, 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 but I was just given that, that, that wonderful intro. Um, so, yeah, I'm uh, doing this is a kind of difficult one because, you know, some people come into this uh, knowing a lot about something like the manosphere and then others maybe don't know so much about it. So it's kind of like trying to walk this fine line of kind of uh, introducing something, but also, you know, for those of you who are kind of familiar with this kind of, you know, problematic territory, uh, pushing it a bit further as well. Um, uh, the first thing to say, so again, better understanding the manosphere's appeal among heterosexual boys and men, underpinning the work that I'm trying to do in this area is a concept um, from Andrea Lobb, a uh, feminist media scholar. Uh, the concept's uh, quote unquote critical empathy. Um, and it's a really useful, for, for me, really useful, really interesting concept. Um, and it sort of is exactly what it says. So it's trying to be critical, but also empathetic um in in dealing uh with a sort of a you know a sort of an online culture or a cohort of uh, young men like this um so yes we always need to be critical especially when we're, we're talking about sort of issues of kind of misogyny and and this kind of spread of that in kind of digital spaces and so on but you know in terms of my interest in trying to understand what's driving increasing some would say you know sort of horrifyingly uh sort of large numbers of um sort of young men in this direction 
I think does require a sort of degree of empathy in, in terms of trying to understand the, the kind of broader social context and so on. Um, where it gets sort of a bit difficult or, you know, interesting at least for me as a kind of cisgender hetero white guy um, is that, you know, I have to be kind of quite sort of aware of my own positioning in terms of studying this uh, this group that, you know, I'm essentially sort of broadly a part of in terms of um, cis-hetero guys. So um, so I need to be careful that my empathy doesn't turn into sort of a, a kind of an apologism for um, some of the kind of, you know, sort of to toxic, quote-unquote, outcomes uh, that are coming out from this space. Um, I mean, if you have no idea what I'm talking about right now with the manosphere, fear not, I'm going to sort of explain it, explain it all. Um, uh, and I should say, in terms of where my work on this sits uh, in the kind of broader, because there's a lot of people doing this work, uh, where my work sits in the broader kind of agenda of this, is that, you know, when, you, when you're when you asked, you know, when your core focus is to try and better understand this cohort, um, it leads to a very different sort of set of inquiries or questions to if you're making sense of the outcome of this, which is obviously online misogyny, um uh, itself so um trying to understand um the cohort is, is a different thing from combating um the product of, of this of this culture um they're, then they're perfectly sort of complementary inquiries but they do sort of lead to sort of different places um and yeah and i said to bart before I'm, I'm trying to do a lot here so i'm kind of like giving a survey of sort of how i got to this place what i'm doing now and into the future um, and you know, sort of embedding in that kind of some theory stuff and uh, and and all sorts. So, um, but I'm kind of keeping an eye on time as well. Man, I'll get my phone out uh, because uh, I do want, I, you know, I do want to leave time for questions. And I, you know, you can be as brutal as you want because it always just helps me to sort of find the blind spots in what I'm doing. Uh, and also, unlike some uh, people who do these talks, um, who sometimes. Uh, well, anyway, I I really welcome just thoughts and reflections. So they don't have to be direct questions, but if if anything sort of comes to mind in terms of as I talk or whatever, uh, at the end, please feel free to 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 jump in. Um, and yeah, if I find myself going over the forty five minutes, I'll try and just like take out the last bit or whatever because I really do want to give you guys time to kind of respond to what I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, please work. Come on, here we go. Yeah, it worked. Um, okay, so to give you some background, um, I got into this sort of stuff on the manosphere, um, which is essentially this kind of uh, reactionary male-centred online spaces, sort of reactionary anti-feminist um, and often sort of outright sort of misogynistic online spaces. And I got into this through my earlier research looking at boys, men and masculinity, uh, specifically in video gaming communities. Uh, uh, along with kind of exploring this kind of concept of what's called geek masculinity. Um, so to quickly sort of summarise that gaming stuff, um, so gaming, you know, as uh, as a sort of a culture and as a sort of, a, you know, sort of online community or whatever, um, it's been sort of widely characterised, um, and especially since this uh, sort of famous moment, this sort of Gamergate con controversy of I think it's like 2016, I think, um, but the, the gaming community, particularly the sort of uh, boys and men in that community, have been sort of similarly kind of described as a kind of a toxic community. Um, so um, in this specific uh, context, one governed by this kind of white, cis-hetero, geek masculinity uh, that sort of marginalises and silences, um, you know, the kind of increasing number of, you know, sort of other gamers uh, who don't kind of fall within that sort of um that gamer identity. And, of course, when I say don't fall within that identity, I'm talking in terms of along the lines of gender, in terms of race, sexuality, uh, ability, disability, uh, and so on. Um, so similar to what I'm doing now, the, I mean, the core contribution I tried to make with this work, um, and I'm sort of continuing this thread because I think it's really kind of interesting, fluid space, Oh, and I should, uh, here I should uh, shout out to my sort of ongoing collaborator with a lot of this work, uh, who's uh, Professor Stephen Roberts uh, at Monash University in Australia, way back home where I was originally from, moved to the UK in 2018. Um, but the kind of core contribution I've tried to make is to kind of highlight the nuances and the kind of, I guess, the, the kind of hidden ideological complexities 
that you actually see when you do a do kind of deep dive into sort of research into these communities. Uh, so they're not, so yes, there are these toxic strains. Um, and that's a term I'm going to come back to in a second, actually. Um, you know, sort of reactionary right wing strains, but there's also counter strains that are not always sort of like revealed. And and I think with the work that I did there, and I think the video gaming community and sort of the boys and men in that community are best seen as a kind of expressing a contested uh, masculinity rather than all you know all round sort of right wing or left wing or whatever. Um, I mean, when you're doing this kind of research, like trying to kind of highlight nuances and complexities in what are largely seen as kind of problematic kind of cultures online. Uh, it, it's a, it is a tricky thing because you, I think it's important to do that, to sort of do justice to what's actually really going on out there, but you want to do so without kind of muddying the waters of this very important gender into uh, agenda, sorry, of, you know, fighting back against the kind of reactionary stuff. Um, uh, it's also, uh, I always have to keep in mind that, it, I mean, if you look closely at any, enough at anything, you can find kind of nuance in it. Um, and uh, I, I am, I am uh, sort of compelled to swear right now, but there's a reason for it. There's a wonderful sociological paper from a few years ago um, and in quite a high-level uh, uh, journal. Uh, and the title of the paper, uh, and uh, apologies to Bart, but I have to do it. And this is a peer-reviewed work, so I'm, you know, so I have that as backup. But the title of the paper is "Fuck Nuance," um, and it's essentially a challenge to precisely the kind of work that I and others do. Uh, and the uh, and the argument of that is that you know, look, if we just spend our whole time picking apart, finding nuances and complexities, you know, within these broader patterns, then you know, as sociologists. Uh, we essentially sort of undermine our own project of trying to sort of categorise and pattern things. But um, anyway, so uh, two key publications, uh, one of which Bart just mentioned, are uh, uh, one that I did for New Media and Society, uh, again, so a while ago now, um, and that was looking at the kind of complex performances of masculinity uh, among uh, popular game streamers uh, on YouTube. I mean, it's so old now. I mean, it was. I think it's it's, it's published in two thousand and eighteen. I think, but obviously, we were kind of working on it in the in the years before, a couple of years before. But it's quite old now, and it's been quite kind of foundational. So it's cited quite a lot in terms of uh, YouTube game streaming or tick or Twitch or whatever. But it, it's so old that you didn't even have the term game streamers back then. So I think the term that we used was like YouTube gaming vloggers, uh, which looks really sort of like. Uh, sort of old-fashioned now. But um, so then the second thing is a more recent uh, short book for Palgrave, uh, you know, we're sort of analysing, I think it was like a year's, year's worth of posts and replies on this kind of big gaming culture subreddit uh, on, on Reddit, obviously. So uh, r slash gaming is the big subreddit. Um, this was co-written also with Timothy Graham at uh, Queensland University of Tech, so shout out to, to him as well. Uh, it's good that I'm shouting these things out now that it's being recorded because if they ever watch it and I don't mention them, they'll get really uh, sort of upset. But um, So, yeah, I mean, at some point I kind of felt kind of compelled to explore a broader set of digital spaces uh, that were kind of all similarly governed by these kinds of problematic or seem to be governed by these problematic forms of masculinity that are similarly characterised as quote-unquote toxic. Toxic is a term and a concept, uh, not just me, but um, me and others. I, I'm kind of finding myself increasingly not wanting to use for a number of reasons. Um, in short, it, it's reductive. Um, and I think, you know, Connell's hegemonic masculinity th theory gives us all that we need uh, without recourse to this more simplistic uh, sort of understanding. But, um, I mean, I'd be happy to expand on that uh that point uh, a bit late, later, um, if you know, if anyone's got any questions. So yes, uh, I mean, the first major paper, I guess, I published on this area that I'm looking at today. Again, this was with Steve and also uh, a great sort of PhD candidate and computational sort of whiz of his, uh, Callum Jones. And uh, this uh, was published in 2022. Uh, it's online first at the moment. Uh, 2022 for New Media and Society also. Um, 
and this was really pivotal for me in terms of kind of all the newer projects and the kind of the, the, my thinking around this area that I'm going to sort of like walk you through in a second. Um, so, yeah, as it says here, the article was titled, you know, it's one of those kind of, you know, sort of conventional titles where you basically just pick, you know, kind of an evocative quote from the data set and you stick it in the, the subtitle or whatever. Uh, so it was, it was titled, or in the actual title, uh, How Do I Become Blue Pilled? Um, hold on a second, I need to drink water. Um, and I guess the core of this article, so how do I become blue pill? What the hell does blue pill mean? I'll, I'll explain in a second. Um, the core of the article is really, uh, yeah, it's really sort of encapsulated in this notion of the blue pill and wanting to achieve it, um, which I'll try to uh, briefly explain. But to do that, uh, and uh, apologies to those who know all this stuff anyway, but I do have to first explain what the manosphere is, uh, just so we're all on the same page. Um, so the manosphere, as many of you might know, uh, refers to this kind of, you know, it's a very sort of loose network of men online who espouse reactionary and anti-feminist views. Um, as I sort of said uh, earlier, often veering into what I think it's fair to say is often quite extreme uh, far-right misogynistic sort of ideologies. Um, so it's a quote-unquote network, um, again, it's quite loose, um, that includes, um, again, as some of you know, incels or the kind of involuntary celibate subset, uh, subset, sorry. Uh, you then have the kind of, you know, sort of misogynistic kind of pickup artist kind of subset of the manosphere, uh, but essentially just this kind of whole range of these, and in some time of, you know, not always kind of like in line with each other, a whole range of these essentially kind of aggrieved young men who uh, blame progressivism uh, and blame feminism uh, and so on, and the kind of mainstreaming of, the, of these forces, they blame uh, blame these forces on the challenges that they and their sort of fellow contemporary sort of men uh, face. And, of course, you know, he's all over the news. Andrew Tate is really the sort of big kind of, con you know, sort of recent uh, sort of uh, example of this. And, you know, and his followers, are, you know, are, are just huge. Um, there was a sort of YouGov poll recently Um uh, that sort of had sort of 25, approximately 25% of sort of young men, uh, you know, sort of agree on his, you know, fairly sort of, you know, reaction, not fairly, very reactionary positions on, you know, you know, we, you know, women should be in the home and, you know, mothers and, you know, and, and so on. And um, one essentially should be the property of, of men as if it was sort of like, you know, uh, 1845 or whatever. Um, so, yes, so that's that. So the, the pill stuff, the blue pill, red pill. So the, uh, you have this red pill slash blue pill analogy, and it and it comes from the science fiction film, and some of you will know The Matrix. Ah, oh, the 90s. Who remembers the 90s? Um, uh, but it comes from The Matrix um, uh, in which the protagonist, a guy called Neo, played by uh, Ke Keanu Reeves, um, uh, he's offered the choice by his mentor, uh, Morpheus, to either swallow the red pill uh, and in doing so he will see how the world really is um, or to swallow the blue pill um, and by doing that he would kind of remain forever a kind of a prisoner to this kind of false reality of modern society. Um, and manosphere types use this as a metaphor for either adopting their reactionary views and, you know, kind of seeing how the world really is, uh, in other words, swallowing the red pill, uh, or continuing to kind of adhere to what they see as being this kind of progressive and feminist conspiracy uh, that's kind of, you know, turned society against men, uh, and in other words, to swallow the blue pill. So... Um, the article itself was a study of one of the kind of key online spaces for the manosphere uh, and for this kind of this breeding ground for kind of reactionary views among boys and men online. Uh, and that space, of course, is uh, the 4chan message board platform. Um, uh, if you've ever gone on there, it's, it's, a, it's a wild place. Uh, what's shocking about it is that um, there's another uh, space called 8chan. I don't know if it's operating at the moment, um, and uh, as 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 you know, grim as 4chan is, uh, there was, it was obviously not grim enough for some people, so they had to do an offshoot, which is even worse. But um, anyway, so specifically, the study was uh, looking at a board on the platform called the Advice Board or uh, forward slash ADV forward slash, 
uh, in which you find this predominantly sort of self-identifying cis hetero young men, uh, also generally white from what you can inf- what we could infer from the data. Um, but they sort of go to seek advice on this kind of what's widely seen by the outside world as this toxic sort of masculinity space. Um, go to seek advice, you know, about various issues in their lives. Um, and really, the focus of most of the posts uh, was on their failings in terms of sex and romance, their failings in terms of trying to get a sort of secured, you know, sort of job. Uh, but then also this broader sense of uh, of what I guess I described in the paper as a kind of free floating uh, hopelessness. Uh, and what I mean by that is that you had a lot of these posts that couldn't really articulate to themselves why they felt so empty and hopeless and and were sort of overtly saying, well, it's, it's not to do necessarily with, you know, being a failure with girls or, or, or whatever it was. Um, a common example of the, this, the different kinds of themes that were there um, um, is, you know, you had these guys that were posting for advice on how to meet and be more appealing to women. Uh, and the posts were often or mostly, I should say, deeply self-deprecating, if not just outright sort of self-hating and very sort of brutal about how they sort of talked about themselves. Uh, you know, and, you know, these sort of guys would sort of casually convey, you know, what losers they were, how ugly what they are, how no one's going to ever love them, uh, and so on. Um, uh, importantly, though, this was two important things. One of the things that was important in the data, there was no, and so a lot of these guys were like, you know, help me, I just want to sort of meet women and, you know, have a relationship, etc. cetera. Um, none of these posts were, were objectifying, or to use a concept from Mark McCormack, a sociologist here in the UK, none of them were con- conquestual. Uh, in in their sort of uh, sentiment, in the sense in the sense of they weren't just sort of looking for sex, and or they weren't just you know sort of seeing women as prizes to be had. They were they just really kind of wanted meaningful kind of heterosexual relationships. Um, also, really importantly, none of the uh, posts, and this was a very large data set, um, none of the posts conveyed any of the kind of blaming of others for their predicament. So you had none of that kind of anti-feminist aggrievement that's been kind of well-documented in other research on these kinds of spaces uh, and with incels uh, specifically. Um, and, yeah, I mean, ultimately sort of what came through in these posts and, and yeah, for me it's really evoked in that how do I become blue-pilled uh, sort of title quote is that these, you know, sort of precarious young men really just wanted to achieve a kind of mainstream or, if you like, kind of orthodox kind of normalcy uh, rather than kind of rail against the world or rail against women uh, or sort of blame others for their predicament or, or whatever. Um, and I, I say orthodox normalcy or orthodox masculinity or, let, or maybe traditional masculinity, uh, you know, and here, you know, I, I might have used the term like hegemonic masculinity, um, which I, I I don't use here. And again, I'm, I'm happy to kind of talk, uh, you know, sort of answer questions about this. It's a theoretic, theoretically, sorry, interesting one, because, uh, you know, in the theory, in the scholarship, uh, you know, sort of, you know, kind of more mainstream forms of traditional masculinity would be seen as part of you know, kind of a bro- broader hegemonic framework. And then this kind of more extreme reactionary stuff would be kind of sitting at the fringe. So it would all be kind of related. But in terms of their own understandings of this stuff, you know, you could see how this kind of more mainstream traditional or orthodox masculinity was something sort of pulling away from that extreme. So they wanted to sort of come back towards a sort of uh, maybe, uh, if you like, a, a Jordan Peterson view of the world versus rather than a sort of Andrew Tate view of the world. Um, anyway, so in terms of the responses, which is where it gets kind of uh, even more interesting. So, I mean, 4chan being, you know, the kind of one of the last vestiges of the Wild West of Web 1.0, um, the responses to these kind of quite heartfelt and uh, self-deprecating advice posts, uh, they were much more varied. So... Um, you, you know, you did have your fair share of just abusive responses. So other, you know, users just telling them to, you know, just to F off and you're a loser and get out of here or whatever. Uh, then you did have a small set of responses that were clearly aimed at actually indoctrinating these guys into reactionary manosphere views. So they were trying to get them to reframe their problems um, in terms of how society had failed them, how women are evil, et cetera, et cetera. 
But finally, uh, and this was genuinely surprising to us, the largest proportion of responses, uh, uh, not by much, I should say, but, you know, the fact that it was is in itself surprising, but the largest uh, uh, set of responses, you know, were these kind of benign, sometimes quite sort of poignant, you know, offers of support and advice on how to cope with the pressures of day-to-day -day life, you know, guys saying, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm in a similar position or I've been in a similar position and, you know, stay strong and all that kind of stuff. So in terms of thinking about this board, uh, this 4chan board and as a kind of, you know, pro the proverbial online community, um, it was just really kind of interesting ideological mix of, you know, yes, the kind of toxic stuff, but then this kind of benign stuff and, you know, and sort of poignant stuff and, you know, every, everything in between, you know. Uh, surprise, surprise, like, like society itself. Um, hold on. Um, I, but really, I guess the take-home message from the paper was that you have, you know, a significant cohort of these young men, um, you know, kind of clearly lost and sort of broken sort of young cis-hetero uh, men who, you know, who are entering into these kind of allegedly kind of toxic spaces, uh, basically for a sense of belonging. Um, and really importantly, to express their vulnerabilities in these kinds of frank and brutal ways um, that they don't feel comfortable doing via kind of mainstream channels of support, whether it's family and friends or sort of, you know, mental health support or, or whatever. Um, uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, many of them don't actually seem to come into the spaces actually kind of exhibiting the reactionary uh, misogynistic outlooks and um, and I guess, you know, obviously the process of some of them at least adopting those, you know, really kind of echoes any kind of radicalising uh, process. Um, I mean, if you think about Tate, if, any, if anyone's sort of familiar with his content, you know, as grim and as awful as it might seem to some of us, you know, what he offers and what guys like that offer is a very simple, very kind of Manichaean view of the world, which really kind of places into a nice, neat context, uh, you know, sort of men's anxieties. Um, by Manichaean, I mean good versus evil. I mean, he sets up a very sort of clear sense of who is to blame and who is the bad guy in your life. And, um, you know, for people who are precarious, that's, you know, that that's, that's appealing, um, even if it's a grim worldview. So... Um, I mean, the final lines of the paper or the article uh, are that thing that, you know, as Bart would know and anyone who's sort of published uh, sort of journal article stuff, was something along the lines of, you know, more work needs to be done. You know, we sort of invite, you know, sort of people to do similar stuff and see if what they found there, we, we uh, what we found here, they find there, et cetera, et cetera. And the other key point, sort of take home message of the paper, so we need to think about the implications on the is for kind of men's health narratives and kind of mainstream men's health kind of interventions uh, and the way in which, at least uh, from what we could see there, this cohort is very sceptical about that kind of mainstream narrative about them and, you know, seeking to sort of help them or whatever. Um, so, yeah, the 4chan paper, I guess, kind of opened things up for me in the sense of wanting to look at, you know, as many other spaces, as I guess, as, as you can do within a, a you know, a a, you know, a finite life or whatever, uh, but ones that were associated with these issues and also, I guess, dare I say it, actually try and make a difference in, you know, you know what's essentially, I guess, a kind of radicalisation process, but coming into it again with that kind of critical uh, empathy. So I'm going to do a bit of a survey. How much time? Are we? Oh, we're okay, I think. Um, I'm going to do a bit of a survey of some current projects in a second. Um but I think it'll help to give a more concrete sense of the kind of theoretical gap that I'm trying to fill with this stuff um, or that I found myself kind of filling with this. Um, so in terms of the kind of established thinking around the manosphere uh, and this kind of seemingly kind of counterintuitive position, positioning of kind of victimhood or aggrievement that's held by, you know, increasing numbers of kind of cis-hetero and predominantly white young men, you know, a cohort that are, you know, in sort of kind of objective or historical terms, you know, very privileged one. Um, a lot of uh, the, the well, very important work comes out of feminist media scholarship. Um, before I talk about what I see as being one sort of key blind spot in that work, I really do want to make clear that what I'm talking about here is some hugely important uh, sort of groundbreaking research, uh, you know, that I 
site, you know, a lot and, you know, continues to kind of inform what I do, you know, at sort of every level. Um, uh, and no, this is not sort of disingenuous faint praise before I then go and sort of trash it or whatever. Um, uh, also, I should say, to some extent, this blind spot or this gap is one that's kind of been left more by the overall impression of, of this body, of this growing body of scholarship, rather than sort of specific papers, which, you know, uh, you know, scholars are very sort of careful to not sort of over egg the argument when you're talking about one paper or another. But then, you know, the kind of like the the cumulative sort of uh, sort of take home message of it, I guess. Um, but yeah, as, as important as this, as this work uh, is and continues to be, and, and not just generally, but for me, um, and specifically, I should say, the foundational work of Debbie King. Um, uh, it's often framed via a masculinity con theoretical concept that I think is only kind of partly helpful in trying to understand what's going on here. And the concept that I'm talking about is what's called "quote unquote" hybrid masculinity. Um, uh, so hybrid masculinity, uh, at least in this context, is essentially used uh, to sort of square this circle of understanding, um, you know, this kind of seemingly bizarre scenario where you have a bunch of cis-hetero white guys, you know, sort of historically, as I said, and empirically privileged, somehow claiming to be kind of marginalised or, you know, forgotten by society. Um, and hybrid masculinity uh, essentially kind of explains the phenomenon as a strategic collective move. Uh, so it's a sort of disingenuous claim of victimhood from a certain cohort of men. And, and it ultimately works to reinforce patriarchal systems of oppression. Um, in terms of the kind of overall effect or impact or whatever, I mean, this is 100% spot on. In terms of the function of, of, of what's going on here, this is 100% spot on. You know, the overall effect of this kind of reactionary agreement is absolutely to legitimate the status quo that's, you know, that's experienced some sort of challenges by forces of social change. Um, and, of course, if you're thinking about the motivations that drive the kind of leaders and the big influences of this kind of disorganised movement, you know, whether it's Andrew Tate or even maybe someone, again, lower down that sort of like ideological spectrum like Jordan Peterson or whatever, um, uh, then, yeah, I think it is safe to say that there's a degree of strategic disingen disingenuity and sort of, you know, um, uh, capitalising um, that's clearly in the mix. Having said that, though, I mean, as someone who has, a, has had a long-term fascination with cults and cult leaders, even here I think there's an interesting complexity in that you find with cult leaders, for example, that, yes, they're kind of like scam artists in one part of their brain, but they also sort of drink their own Kool-Aid in another part of the brain, uh, particularly over time as they continue to ha inhabit the, this, this, these kinds of worlds that they build. Um, but anyway, the issues that I have uh, with this core analysis are sort of kind of two or kind of uh, two things that are related. One is that it doesn't provide much scope for taking it face value or taking seriously, you know, the anxieties and grievances, however misdirected they are, uh, taking them seriously, you know, that a lot of these uh, sort of guys are, are clearly sort of feeling and articulating. And then two, and sort of related to one, uh, it positions the manosphere. And, and I do wonder about the extent to which even this is a kind of like overly kind of delimiting uh, sort of uh, sort of category. Um, uh, it, it, it sort of like makes it an ideologically uh, homogenous sort of blob or entity. Um, and one that's kind of homogenous in terms of the kind of motivations of people who are in it, these young guys that are in it, um, what they get out of it and so on. Um, and again, to use the kind of cult analogy, I remember recently I was watching, um, like one of the, it was quite grim, but I was watching a documentary, documentary footage of the Jonestown uh, cult in the 70s. And it just sort of struck me, uh, and this was pre the whole sort of tragedy or, or whatever, the murder slash suicide or whatever, but there was all this footage of this this large sort of community. I can't remember what country they sort of ended up sort of running off to, but you know they were kind of farming and stuff, and it, and it was a really diverse group of people. And I just kind of always found myself like looking at those the, that kind of footage, and and you have to keep in mind that you know they're not all sort of like motivated the same. Or, you know, all, there's all sorts of people might have been there for all sorts of different reasons and and believed all sorts of different things within that. But um. 
So I guess what I saw in the 4chan data was this clear pattern of guys who, A, you know, were clearly struggling with various aspects of their life and, B, inhabiting these manosphere spaces but not yet actually adopting the reactionary and anti-feminist uh, explanations for their predicaments. And it seemed clear to me that, you know, that this was something that was worth kind of unpacking a bit more. So, yeah, I mean, essentially that's what I've been doing um, across a number of recent and ongoing projects Um and yes, it's always a privilege to be able to sort of, you know, sort of share this stuff with new people. Um, so I'm going to give a bit of a summary of each of the on on these final slides. Um, uh, well, no, a summary of the of the kind of three different things I'm doing, and then I'll go into a bit more detail on the final slides. What's nice about this is that you know, for us, you know, about know this, they kind of represent different kind of things that we're meant to be doing. So one's a sort of a grant capture thing, one's a paper, and then. Um, What's the third thing? Uh, oh yes, and then oh no, and the thing I did last year with the report. Anyway, let's let's, let's do this. Um, so yes, the first thing, um, uh, a lot of last year actually was devoted uh, to this report, looking at the gaps and weaknesses in the UK government's recently passed uh, online safety bill, or it's an online safety act now, having uh, had royal assent or whatever it is. Um, and this really opened up a lot of opportunities in terms of networks and more kind of, and my kind of general thinking about this stuff. Um, then there's a follow-up paper. It's currently under review at uh, social media and society. Uh, so fingers crossed there, um, uh, which I'll sort of go into as well. And then, you know, the big sort of uh, proverbial holy grail, you know, sort of work developing a sort of grant uh, uh, proposal uh, for one funder. But, you know, if it doesn't get up there, then, you know, I'll shop it around or whatever. Um, and, and that's essentially, yeah, you know, to use the cliche, scaling up this research, but also doing something else that um, I think needs to be done and isn't being done enough. Um, so, yeah, uh, with the first, um, okay, we're good, I think. Uh, we um, so the first part of last year was mainly, as I said, devoted to this report I worked on with um, uh, my sort of fellow researchers in uh, it's the Post Digital Intimacies Research Cluster within the Centre for Post Digital Cultures at Cov Uni, um, and that's uh, Lindsay Balfour, uh, Adrian uh, Evans, and Sarah Sarah Mary. So we were looking at the government's online safety bill, or OSB as it's often referred to, and how it really didn't do what it, it actually earlier set out to do uh, in terms of, you know, protecting, you know, this whole large range of individuals and groups uh, from uh, online harms like sort of harassment online and so on, which, of course, you know, specifically in terms of harassment is a heavily gendered uh, thing, and gender wasn't even featuring in the bill until the end, and we like to think we've played a part in changing that. Uh, anyway. Uh, but it, it essentially been whittled down by the Tory government, uh, mostly to a focus on children and then kind of making sure that illegal content wasn't sort of proliferating online. So it was the, our report was a four part thing, you know, with each part relating to our kind of respective areas of research. So Lindsay's section was focused on women and their use of what's called feminine tech or femtech devices and apps. Uh, 80s work, which I guess most directly kind of overlapped into mine, was focused on sexual harassment and image-based abuse. And then finally, Sarah's section, not finally because I'm finally, but um, Sarah's section focused on the experiences of neurodiverse and uh, disabled sort of online users. And so then my part was on boys and men's engagements in these quote-unquote toxic communities. And, yeah, it's referring to the sorts of Tate-like uh, manosphere communities uh, you know, through which an increasing number of young guys are acquiring kind of very reactionary uh, and I guess, well, it sounds sort of a bit conservative, sort of antisocial sort of views on things. Um, uh, the methodology of this project was based on a series of workshops uh, that we conducted with stakeholders, so sort of industry and kind of third sector types. You know, we had, we all, all of us had these kind of really illuminating discussions, not just about how the OSB was kind of failing to address certain important issues, but ultimately what can and should be done, you know, to make the, the internet a more, you know, sort of healthy and, and inclusive space, keeping in mind that there are there's a real debate there to be had about sort of free speech and so on. Um, I'm really happy to say recently uh, the, the report did get referenced in uh, government material about the implement, in, sorry, implementation of the Act, So, um, which is really important because a lot of the kind of 
the actual detail in terms of how this is going to play out is in the implementation kind of policy stuff rather than the bill itself. Um, so, yeah, I conducted this work with a uh, men's health forum here in the UK and a number of others kind of men's and health and youth representatives. You know, it was actually quite challenging uh, specifically uh, for me, the process, because in the case of my section, I was trying to get people, you know, with a principal interest in boys and men's well-being uh, to sort of have a, a kind of critical conversation about the impacts of their attitudes and uh, behaviours on other people's well-being. Um, and you could tell with some of the people I reached out to and, and did the thing with that they were quite, they were sort of quite apprehensive about me sort of being this kind of stereotypical kind of left-wing social science academic who was just going to come in and just say, oh, men are awful, how are we going to sort of reform them sort of thing? You know, which and <laughs> in there, of course. But um, uh, the meeting point that we came to, and it was informing to me as much to them, I guess, was really the idea that the adoption of these sorts of reactionary sort of views are harmful, not just to the girls and women and others who are exposed to them, but also to the boys and men uh, who are adopting them uh, in the sense of kind of further marginalising them from kind of mainstream society. Um, the key take-home message from the workshop um was really that this issue won't be solved by any level of content moderation. However important this still is in terms of kind of, you know, the impacts of the content. Uh, and it also won't really be solved by any kind of focus on the internet because, you know, this is ultimately a social and it's a cultural issue. It's not a technological issue. Uh, um, and what, what's playing out online is ultimately just a reflection of, of wider, you know, sort of social and cultural realities. Um, I mean, if I'm to be completely honest, I've become increasingly pessimistic about the, you know, the the potential that government policy can play in sort of shifting ch cultural life in these ways. But you know, I guess that's neither here nor there. Um, anyway, the opportunity was hugely fruitful in a number of ways. Uh, first, it showed me that there's a you know growing interest among people on that front line and trying to generate kind of new empathetic sort of understandings around how and why, you know, this is sort of happening. Um, actually, Debbie King, uh, the feminist media scholar, who, again, has sort of informed my work, who I, and I saw, you know, sort of mentioned earlier, uh, she actually helped re uh, launch the report uh, via 80s invite. And I was kind of a bit sort of like concerned uh, before she sort of came that she would kind of see my contribution as this kind of apologist's attempt to downplay the impacts of the manosphere. Uh, but I got to hang out with her quite a bit and, you know, we did one of those sort of dinners afterwards or whatever. Um, uh, and to my surprise, and maybe I shouldn't have been surprised, but she was like 100% on board with, with this agenda in terms of trying to understand the drivers and so on and not seeing that in any way is sort of uh, in conflict with, with the other part of the agenda. Um, on a more practical level, it gave me obviously huge experience in, you know, as someone who just lives in this academic bubble, it was nice to sort of go out there into the real world with people who are actually sort of, you know, you know, sort of trying to deal with some of these issues. All right. So um, we're still good. Um, the second key thing is a new article that I recently completed. Uh, and again, it's just under review at the moment. Um, and it was with the same uh, sort of team as the uh, 4chan one, so Steve and Cal. Um, uh, and it's, I can choose to be a good man, even if I got a raw deal. Um, and here's where all the, uh, terminology comes in. Oh, it's an awful title. Heteromasculinity, neoliberalism and de-radicalization, you know, slash stoicism. And if you did, if you weren't like in this area, you'd go, what the hell is that? But anyway, um, so yeah, this sort of explicitly expands from the new media and society article I talked about earlier. Um, as I mentioned in that article's conclusion, we pointed to the need to explore other kind of similarly kind of male-centred online spaces to see if what we'd found there, uh, you know, in terms of non-reactionary young men going into these spaces for a sense of community and to express their vulnerabilities to see whether this was occurring in other spaces. Uh, the answer to that, um, in terms of this study of a huge subreddit of around kind of five to 600,000 members well, sort of yes and sort of no. Um, it's actually the kind of no part that's most interesting to me. Um, to give some context with this, uh, Reddit, as many of you will know, it's an online platform. It's similar to but nowhere near as, I guess, no notorious as 4chan. Uh, but, yes, it's it's been sort of for a long time uh, associated with kind of problematic male-centred online communities and the, and the Manosphere specifically. It used to be home to two of the biggest incel subreddits, um, but there was what was called the Reddit purge over the last few years, 
where they they took those kind of really overt ones off. Um, but there's still any number of kind of uh, sort of men's rights activist forums and, uh, and so on. Um, so we chose to study uh, this uh, specific subreddit because it's very large, it's very kind of male-centred and actually kind of predominated, um, and it's focused on users with an interest in uh, capital S stoicism and kind of stoic approaches to life's uh, challenges. Uh, in terms of background today, um, so you have this association and it's in both gender scholarship and in kind of mainstream discourse, uh, discourse between kind of notions of stoicism, this idea of the suppression of emotions, the idea that people just need to kind of toughen up in response to life's challenges, uh, the association of this with harmful aspects of traditional or orthodox or hegemonic masculinity. So, yeah, we figured this would be a kind of an ideal forum for continuing that research on how men are entering into these kinds of spaces for support. And I guess what we expected to see uh, was a sort of complex, you know, like the 4chan thing, a kind of complex range of expressions that would give us more data on, you know, kind of boys and men's anxieties and what they get from being a part of these communities. Um, these communities associated with problematic gender attitudes. What we actually found was very different and really interesting, uh, I think. So, um, so r slash stoicism is one of the key online meeting spaces for discussing uh, what one uh, scholar, uh, who we cited quite a bit in the paper, refers to as quote unquote popular stoicism. Uh, and this is actually a very sort of different thing to kind of general understandings uh, around the kind of suppression of emotions and toughening up and so on. Um, so popular stoicism is sort of a contemporary re reinterpretation of the ancient actual Greek philosophical perspective. And it's actually blown up over the last sort of decade or so via kind of self-help authors, various kind of online spaces, YouTube channels and, and, and whatnot. And in this kind of contemporary reimagining, um, and to be fair, it's one that does, you know, sort of genuinely sort of echo the formal philosophy Stoicism uh, actually becomes a sort of neoliberal uh, self-help strategy for sort of accepting one's life in love and trying to kind of move forward positively in one's mind through hardships. Um, so, yeah, to distinguish between this and those kind of general uses of stoicism and masculinity, this is actually more about emotional management rather than that kind of old school emotional, you know, masculine emotional suppression stuff. And when I say neoliberal, uh, what I mean specifically is that it's also an approach to life's problems uh, that uh, emphasises self-work uh, and individual responsibility and completely avoids uh, the, the kind of realities of socioeconomic inequality that, it, you know, that actually make this kind of self-work and individual responsibility uh, more or less difficult. So in the context of this male-centred subreddit, the essential dynamic is one in which this community of mostly heterosexual boys and men share with each other strategies for dealing with the problems in their lives uh, based on this, you know, contemporary understanding of stoicism. The first really surprising aspect of this data that we drew from this space and again, it was another sort of really big data set of thousands upon thousands of comments across sort of a month, I think, um, was that there was a lot of evidence demonstrating that the community, right from the moderators right down to all the, the users and so on, actually see this space explicitly as an alternative to the kind of toxic manosphere reactionary discourses uh, elsewhere and, you know, espoused by figures like Tate. So this immediately changed the agenda for us from one based on our assumption that this would at least be kind of manosphere adjacent um, and, you know, and therefore still worthy of kind of nuanced analysis to an inquiry into an online community that was quite explicitly positioning itself as an alternative to the manosphere, um, you know, while also still being very strongly grounded in a kind of orthodox heteronormative view of relationships, what men should aspire to uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, in one really important sense, the findings actually did echo the 4chan article in terms of conveying uh, the same set of anxieties that lead boys and men into these online spaces in terms of kind of, you know, uh, sexual and romantic failures, career challenges, uh, and, and that more general sense of isolation or, uh, to use Durkheim's term, enemy um, or directionlessness. Um, but it was the community's kind of non-reactionary or kind of counter-manosphere response to these anxieties that to me is the most interesting thing and also kind of invites its own critical analysis. So again, uh, the broad sentiment across the data uh, was one promoting 
Uh, and to quote our paper, a, quote, softer, more self-reflective and empathetic approach to being a man, uh, especially in respect to sort of heterosexual relations and coming to grips with rejection and failure uh, uh, in that area. Uh, and this, of course, is largely compatible, I think, with, you know, the sorts of mainstream and kind of third sector narratives and interventions that have been offered to kind of combat, quote, unquote, toxic masculinity in the manosphere. Um, where it's also compatible, I think, with these mainstream interventions, and this, I guess, is where my critical work is kind of increasingly going, is this focus on individual responsibility and self-work that's essentially suggested as being the means of overcoming toxic attitudes and behaviours. So I have two sort of related issues with this. Um, one, uh, as I sort of mentioned earlier, you know, this completely sort of renders invisible the social and cultural and economic circumstances that actually make reactionary views appealing to many young guys in the first place. So in this sense, it's actually sort of, well, I mean, sort of imploring young men to kind of, you know, shed your toxic views in order to improve your life is in some ways putting the cart before the horse. Uh, what I mean by that is that it's actually the widespread anxieties around things like precarious employment and socialization, socialized isolation that, lead, that are actually leading them in that direction. Uh, in other words, the worldviews are a product of the circumstances, not the other way around, which, of course, is a kind of sociology one-on-one point. Um, the other issue uh, is that what's sort of being set up here in the kind of broader psychodrama of 21st century sort of developed world cultures and so on is essentially this kind of battle for the hearts and minds of sort of young men especially uh, between on the one hand you have a manosphere culture that has very effectively positioned men as victims of progressive and feminist cultural forces versus this mainstream response that evades any sort of social or cultural explanation and instead just asks young young men to basically just kind of civilise and better themselves. Um, and it seems to me this is a kind of woefully inadequate way of combating the manosphere. Um, and it misses what I think is at least one, you know, potentially really generative strategy of redirecting men's, you know, sort of anxieties and, dare I say, anger, actually towards the economic interests that actually are isolating and disempowering all of us, uh, obviously in different ways and to varying degrees, of course. Um, and, yeah, I mean, in that sense, I just think that sort of um, anti-capitalist arguments or articulations might be much more effective um, uh, as a sort of a counter to the manosphere than the kinds of banal sort of neoliberal responses that are currently sort of on offer. Um, where's, what, what time are we? Oh, shit. Okay, so pardon my French. I'm going to actually stop it there. So the last slide, um, oh, no, I'm going to leave it with one quote and then hopefully we've got time. Um, so the final interesting thing to come out of the article relates to the unexpected nature of the subreddit um, and also what I guess you could call the kind of porous or hazy boundaries of what's referred to as the manosphere. So I'm just going to read out this passage and then, I'll share the slides in terms of this grant thing that I'm working on, which just extends out of this, but I really do want to try and get like a little bit of time for questions. Um, but this is from the paper. Um, the unexpected nature of our findings raises significant questions about what the manosphere actually is, uh, beyond the predominant focus on monstrous figures like Tate and his carter of similarly grandiose misogynistic influences. As Dalian Reed's study of incels demonstrates, there is an under-acknowledged diversity of thought operating in even the most extreme spaces of heteromasculine precarity, one that essentially warrants continuing in-depth and critical case-by-case -case studies, uh, investigations. Moreover, as our data suggests, many hetero boys and men searching for meaning online seem to be doing so across a range of male-centred spaces, one day exposing themselves to the explicitly anti-feminist forums the next imbibing alternative perspectives uh, perspectives in spaces like this one. And through this process, they no doubt each construct their own distinct and fluid ideological patchworks. Um, final slide, which I will share uh, with everyone afterwards, uh, and that's me done. Thank you very much for having me. Hopefully there's still some time for questions. Um, thank you very much, Marcus, uh, for, for this talk. Um, it's like three minutes or something. <laughs> don't worry about it. It's it's all good. Um, okay, I would like to open the, the, the floor for, for discussion and questions. So, um, okay, anybody in the um, in, in the online reality and the real reality behind me, 
Um, so any questions whatsoever? Mm, I guess I don't have a question per se. Uh, can everyone hear me well? Yes. yes yeah, yes. I can. Okay. So I, I was thinking about uh, this topic as well, because, well, I'm one of those uh, people who grew up on the with the internet in a way. And uh, I didn't ever like fall directly into like the manosphere uh, kind of uh, area. But I think that maybe in some alternative uh, world I, I would have. And I thought about Time. how uh, about the idea of like um, when you said that a lot of uh, young men ha have this kind of unexplained uh, ennui, this kind of uh, general sa sadness about things. And I thought about uh, what possible sources, aside from like purely uh, socioeconomic ones, uh, there can be. And I thought about how uh, when I was uh, a kid, I, I thought about like the religious uh, aspect of uh, this as well. Because I thought about how like uh, some of the first things I ever uh, searched out online were specifically atheist videos. And uh, when I was growing up around like 2009 to 2012, there were a lot of uh, uh, YouTube channels which uh, had this kind of very um, so similar to uh, what you said earlier, had this kind of performative uh, reason and logic approach to um, to specifically Christianity, especially, but I bet there were possibly ones for other religions as well. And I thought about how um, an early, th this kind of uh, ability to be exposed early on the internet to various kind of disillusioning uh, material at a young age uh, could be one of the sources, or even in general, the cultural disillusionment with uh, religion, with especially Christianity uh, in the 21st century, I think could also be like something that is worth um, exploring uh, in terms of like what, why, like, uh, because th there is also the idea of like, uh, mm, wh why do, why is there a lack of male communities like in person? How, how have we like socialized? Uh, meant to, mm, to 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 not create uh, even like communities live or like s smaller ones like some people do of course uh, there are gaming gaming communities or like nowadays I guess uh, the platform Discord can be used for like uh, smaller friend groups but still there is this kind of idea of like uh, wh why is it that for men communities are these just general large ones for advice. And not like direct ones of, of friendships. Yeah, oh, there's so much to talk about there. Um, so in terms of that last point, um, I mean, you do have this. You know, there's a lot of data now, especially coming out of America. You know, sort of um, the cohort that we're looking at is most likely to actually be friendless and isolated, um, and also because of their adherence to kind of like traditional modes of masculinity less likely to kind of actually try and reach out as well. Um, and so in terms of like uh, the, the, the possibility for for the digital to be a kind of space of kind of those meaningful connections, you know, sort of, I, I mean, essentially you kind of, I guess, sort of, yeah, like sort of through kind of more intimate discords or whatever. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 get, I, mean I, I guess whether it's online or offline, that those kinds of meaningful friendships seem to um, a lot of the sort of guys, you know, whether it's incels or whatever, seem to struggle to make those connect those more kind of closer intimate connections. Again, whether they're kind of like in the real world space or you know uh, in in those spaces. But I think you know that that definitely would be a good thing. I mean, I think the broader thing that you talk about is really, really interesting to me as someone who, if you sort of asked me when I was coming out of um, doing my PhD and finishing it, I was a big sort of Weber, Max Weber and Nietzsche guy. So I was much more interested in kind of cultural forces and their impacts on people and the kind of decline of religion, the kind of character of, you know, sort of modernity itself um, and, you know, the kind of the struggles of meaning that people have in that. Rather than the more kind of um, kind of material materialist explanation, looking at socioeconomics or whatever. Now I sort of see that it's all just a kind of a mix to me. I mean, we're essentially talking about, you know, just to use the, 
the phrase, you know, late stage capitalist modernity, which has a sort of a neoliberal character. Um, and it's isolating, it's isolating to us, and, and it, but it's it, it's something that cuts across class, I think. I mean, it, it, the class plays into it, but, um, you know, I know plenty of people and young people who are sort of middle class or upper middle class who are, um, you know, sort of, you know, in a very precarious, isolated, much more isolated place. I mean, neoliberalism has devastated community ties in the name of choice and profit and wonderful TVs from, you know, wherever and, and stuff like that. And we need to say that some of that stuff's really appealing. I like my big TV and, and so on. But I think, yeah, I think you're right to point to there's a cultural analysis here as well as a sort of socioeconomic analysis, but it's all kind of like mixed up. And I guess over time, since at least I graduated a few years, you know, many years ago or whatever now, I found myself much more, you know, kind of coming into it realizing that there are there are economic forces that drive those kinds of cultural uh sort of culturally sort of like isolating forces or whatever i don't know if yeah, that's yes. and uh, and could you also talk a little bit about like religious aspect because that was more of the oh yeah the yeah well i mean of... you know capitalist modernity uh you know again looking at a, taking a sort of max weber disenchantment of the world uh sort of view of it i mean you know, you, capitalist modernity, or let's just say modernity, um, you know, from the Industrial Revolution onwards, has been defined by a challenge in constructing those overarching meaningful frameworks to replace religion. And it's not to say that there's not any number of people in society that are religious people, but the society in which we've lived for, uh, you know, the last century or two centuries is not is not one that is governed by consensus, you know, a consensus adherence to a particular sort of religious framework. Um, and, I mean, we, we're getting really sort of like long like long distance looking at this, but I think it's fair to say that in the here and now when looking at this uh, community or, or even another one that, you know, that I think it does speak to a broader question of meaning that modernity itself represents. I don't know if that helps. Yes, thank you. I'm just thinking of uh, of especially the American context. I think the uh, the religious context, the uh, um, the conservative religious context in you know the, the traditional view of of the roles of men and women, right? I think that this is uh, one of the key components of the manosphere, right? The conservative religious based approach to you know, social yeah. hierarchies, right? Would that be uh, right there? Yeah. Like, no, I think absolutely. I mean, I guess, again, somebody sort of, I guess, become increasingly Marxist over time or something, or Marxian. Uh, th there's a famous quote from Marx. Um, oh, God, I'm, just, I'm, I'm drawing a blank at the moment. It's like um, uh, all that is solid melts into air. And the longer quote is essentially about how, mm. you know, capitalism you know, whether it's religious modes of understanding or any sort of cultural normative modes of understanding, capitalism is this relentless process of destroying and recreating um, that human, that to the, the finite human being is just a bewildering sort of thing. Um, so, and, I th and so I think movements like this speak to a general nostalgia that is... Um, and by that I mean, you know, a goal, you know, a lost golden era that in that does take on religious character in some respects. But you know, then I mean, if you look at Trump, make America, make America great again, is a call, a broader call, or at least a sort of a nationalistic call. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I think yeah, I mean, they do speak to kind of a desire for a sort of a simple, simple framework um, that you know as someone with sort of religious friends that, you know, they'll say, you know, those who are actually sort of practicing Christians or Muslims or whatever, they'll say, well, it's actually a bit more complex than like that. It doesn't just suddenly the answer all your questions. So it does tend to be the sort of non-religious or the agnostic or the lost that imagine that religion will solve their problems or a return to some imagined 1950s gender dynamic or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. but yeah, no, I think, I think, you know, that, Linking it to that is is absolute, yeah. And and while they might not always talk in terms of religion, it's kind of always embedded there. Uh, I think you know. Yeah. 
-hmm. Yeah, because the question leads me to another one because um, Reddit and 4chan, these are like global networking platforms. Mm. Um, so I think they uh, um, they appeal to well, no a, a number of different demographics and nationalities, ethnicities. Have you looked into that background, that that um, culturally specific, geographically specific um, background that uh, um, sort of uh, contributes or uh, determines various manosphere activities or practices? Uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of those two studies I talked about before, you know, it becomes quite clear that uh, the users are predominantly from either the US or the UK, not always. Um, um, so they do tend to speak more to those. So in terms of, say, employment, for example, um, a lot of the kinds of great anxieties around precarious employment uh, are related to, you know, in America, it's a sort of a hyper kind of neoliberal uh, sort of precarity. Yeah, yeah. And in the UK, and I, and I don't think that that's all everywhere the same across Europe, for example. Um, uh, interestingly, I'm actually at 2 p.m. today, I'm meeting with uh, someone uh, who I've collaborated with and used to work with, Sabah Hussain, who does work on um, formal and informal education in India and so and the kind of resurgence of right-wing groups. And there's a kind of an invite for a thing coming on the thing. And I, so I reached out to her and said, because we talked about this, I say, I'd love to look at the, you know, because she was saying, yeah, the manosphere is like a thing in India. So I was like, I'd, I'd love to, you know, do a thing. So anyway, I'm meeting with her to work out what we're going to submit as an abstract for this thing. But, um, but I should, I should say to be, you know, uh, to be honest, it, it's not. I haven't rendered it as visible as it should be in, say, the work so far. It's maybe been a bit more implicit that we're talking about kind of English-speaking developed uh, world countries in the user data. Um, um, but yeah, I, I I think more does need to be done. I'm trying to do that in terms of not at foregrounding those national contexts, um, and also looking at other national contexts that might be outside of that sort of obvious one. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, any questions? No, no. Okay, so I have. Um... Well, I have several questions, uh, but I can't, yeah, yeah, cool. I, I, I can't ask him more. Uh, okay, uh, the question is about this uh, uh, this, this, this latest research um, you have uh, done on this uh, on separated stoicism. Um, I'm just thinking how much to 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 to, to uh, what extent that um that uh, that type or that area of manosphere um latches on patriarchy because uh you mentioned that the the the, the fact that this is um, supportive uh, empathetic uh but at the same time there's this uh, neoliberal logics of self uh, self uh, uh self, -work, self work individual responsibility the, these uh, these features to me very much tie in with patriarchy still right it's like the, 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 these uh, these um, these um, let's say more benign practices do not really um do not really um um conceive any alternative uh approach to patriarchy they still fall uh, under the patriarchal um, um, culture in Western societies. How, what was your take on that? Or am, am I completely wrong in saying that? No, no, no. I mean, I think you're completely right in saying that. Um, I mean, I guess I, I, uh, I mean, in terms of trying to turn it uh, into a question. Okay, so yeah, so I mean, one thing I said earlier, which is I'll uh, just sort of say again, which is in terms of, in terms of the theory. Um, you like as anyone who knows the theory would say you know you're absolutely spot on you know that um well the two parts of that is that you know what we might see is a more kind of mainstream or centrist kind of you know positioning in terms of masculinity is uh supports a wider uh you know ongoing sort of patriarchy uh in to the same extent or uh, but it obviously in a very different way to these kinds of fringe extreme sort of positions or whatever. Um, I guess what's thinking about making in terms of just that thing and what, and what I was sort of saying earlier, 
thinking about trying to intervene um, to sort of change, you know, sort of, to sort of pull young guys back from like the manosphere. Um, where it gets kind of complicated is that, so let's say we had like a sort of manosphere young guy in front of us right now who was saying, oh, you know, just, you know, sort of espousing all this sort of extreme stuff. And then you found at the heart of that was really a guy who just really wanted to, you know, um, you know, sort of pull back into a kind of more kind of orthodox conservatism or something like that. And so we kind of have two choices there in terms of this hypothetical person that doesn't exist that I just made up or whatever. You know, we can either say to them, say, say to this young guy, um, oh, well, you do realise, you know, you're just as, it'll be just as bad if you're sort of, you know, in the, you know, neoliberal mainstream propping up patriarchy uh, than if you're an extremist or whatever. And that is not, I don't know if that's going to be a sort of a good strategy in terms of, so I, I, I guess it's sort of like, is there, is there a sort of a sense where you need to kind of compromise, not in terms of the, the analysis and the, the theory, but in terms of trying to sort of change, um, you know, hearts and minds or whatever, is there a sense where we need to kind of, um, you know, accept the wins where we can get them and compromise and and see that you know, yes, mainstream society is is ultimately the problem. Oh, that's such a tricky question, but you know, yeah, because does it rep- I guess does it? I mean, the question is, does it represent a win? If we're able to um, pull a, you know, young men back from an ex, an extreme ideology into a mainstream, which, as you said, as you say, uh, supports longer term and wider patriarchy. I, I mean, that's kind of a question. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah because I'm, I was thinking of of um, of um, you know, bell hooks, right? So, and and her take on on patriarchy and how it's sort of a uh, uh, how it's actually hurting, you know, everyone. Um, yeah. And I'm just thinking, like, you know, like Manosphere is founded on, to use this uh, terminology uh, from Matrix, still it's a kind of a blue pill um, idea of social structure. Right? It does, doesn't go um, deeper than sort of harking back to uh, this orthodox tradition right and, and that's why i'm just this this kind of um this sort of um uh, that's why this discussion comes from 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 this that um um the alternative um ways of practicing manosphere still fall under the category of you no know, hardcore patriarchy they don't they don't go uh, they don't go beyond that they don't transcend patriarchy in itself they just you no know, Exacerbate it in many uh, in in many ways, and this this uh, this, this later latest research that you uh, presented to me seems like a, a epitome of, of 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 this type of um, uh, of uh, male behavior online that basically um, uh, that basically supports patriarchy and doesn't go um, against it. No, no. I mean, I, I will say about the second, the, the subreddit, um, you know, at least from the understanding of the, the you know, the the sort of male users who sort of um, are trying to kind of work out better ways of sort of being and so on. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, the thing is, it's like, you know, you've got, again, you've got this kind of like, you've got the extreme and you've got the mainstream, yeah. um, which is a kind of simplistic sort of distinction or whatever. And um, both of those things, in each their own way, are, are are driving a dynamic that maintains the status quo. And you can think of that in uh, sort of yeah. Marxian capitalist terms, or you can think of that in more feminist patriarchal terms. And of course, they you know that's kind of like the blind men looking at the the elephant from different angles. Yeah. And um, so I mean, I mean, yes, I mean it's, it's interesting thinking about this, but I mean one of the uh, so, like in my my sense of like you know if we if we were to try and uh, combat the manosphere, uh, why not articulate to these guys an, an anti capitalist alternative? Um, another way of looking at it would be to why not? And this might seem kind of like paradoxical or whatever. The other way to the other alternative would be why not actually articulate a feminist um, anti patriarchal uh, 
alternative worldview to these guys in simplest terms just to actually redirect them towards the true enemy and the true cause of their situations, which is this sort of monstrous combination of um, you could call it patriarchal late stage capitalism or whatever you want to call it. But um um and yeah, I mean I guess there's a bit of a tension there in what I was talking about because in what in, in, part, in parts, I'm talking about trying to pull them back to the mainstream as almost a kind of third sector type interven- intervention. But then if we're, you know, um, but then in other parts, I'm talking about articulating that uh, in terms of an anti-capitalism or providing them with a real cultural, social, economic explanation for their plight um, uh, rather than, yeah, the, the, neo, the sort of what I'm calling the neoliberal one, which is very much just around like, do you realise these views are bad and, you know, blah, 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 or whatever? Okay. You know. okay. okay, and one one last question, um, which I want to... Okay, so there is a question from... Uh, oh, so I've got a question. Abby Ward, yes. Um, yeah, no, I was just thinking, um, so for my current dissertation, I'm trying to come up with a theory around incels, so I'm yes, more focused on that part of the manosphere, um, and I'm trying to come up with their own, in like, their own masculinity to them themselves. Think that there's a kind of like a graph sort of thing you know it's like the positive so basically the more toxic they are the deeper they are in the manosphere um and i found it really interesting reading around not just in cells but also men going their own way um yeah and i'm kind of looking at because i'm looking at doing a phd in it um as i'm finding it really interesting kind of the concept of they're actually being polarizing views and they're actually being a reflection of society um, but I'm just thinking, like, with your whole argument with the toxicity thing, I completely agree with it kind of actually being more so a reflection of the hegemonic masculinity that we're seeing. But it's more that it's just showing it in social media and people are being more aware of it. Um, but I'm just like, Absolutely. I'm, just, I'm just curious as to what you think, like, because I think that it's with the graph, it's kind of like, it's one of those 3D ones, I can't remember the posh term for it but where like there is a three-dimensional aspect to how it all works so with the depth of the manosphere the extremes that you see in with the amount of um, misogyny but I also have a like when you said about the um kind of feeling bad for them the apologetic sort of aspect um with the area of the black pill with the they these incels kind of blame them their physical appearance for their lack of um sexual success so I just yeah, I think it's quite an interesting aspect to kind of consider. And the fact that you've got a paper coming out about sources, I think it's going to be really interesting to look at um, and how that relates to the emotional side of it, because I think it's not really focused upon as much in the area. But yeah, that was kind of... Yeah, yeah, no, we say, I mean, I, I, you sound like you're really kind of, you know, on top of sort of understanding a number of different dimensions. Um. I, I'm not familiar with the kind of three-dimensional thing that you were talking about, but it did make me think about some of the debates I've had with, um, and I'm, you know, I'm currently uh, uh, supervising a, another PhD on on incels with, that's sort of going in sort of different direction to me. But um, uh, so I tend to kind of focus on the kind of social cultural drivers of this stuff. Um, but as someone has, uh, you know, a couple of people, including my uh, PhD candidate, uh, have kind of kind of foregrounded back to me that there is a technological nut aspect to this and um and you know sort of things like effect theory are, are quite helpful here in the sense that you know from my understanding I, I tend to see it like you're sort of saying you know the internet is just a reflection of what's going on in society that's not actually entirely true and I maybe overstate that argument and when you do see it as a reflection of society you're you're, you're kind of conceiving of these spaces essentially as just groups of people who happen to be in the, on an online space. But the online spaces themselves and the kind of technological affordances that they sort of offer, they kind of take on a life of their own as well. So incels, as we understand it, is not just a group of sad, lonely guys on the internet who hate women. It's also a technological fi- sort of field that has kind of shaped the way that that's turned into in cells, if that makes sense. I don't, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm kind of just bouncing off what you said, so I'm not sure if that's in any way helpful. But No, yeah, uh, no it is, it's really helpful. Oh, good. Okay, yeah, excellent, excellent. And, again, I should say that this other aspect is not something that's kind of like front and centre in my stuff, but I'm increasingly – because I'm very kind of um, 
I don't like techno determinist views and I don't like it in policy or scholarship, this idea that the internet is making us all bad. Um, and I think the thing you uh, mentioned there, there's a great concept from a guy called Milton Muller in, in America, the concept of hyper transparency, that the internet is often blamed for the things that it actually just for the first time reveals in a sort of hyper way. Uh, whether it's misogyny or polarization or whatever. But missing from that is there is an aspect where it does intensify those things and it gives them a certain shape and a certain character that uh, wouldn't be the case uh, with without that those kind of actual kind of platforms and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Question in the room? Please, yes, hello. Um, I had a question or actually uh, just... I want to ask, um, since we've started with Gamergate as a sort of jumping off point and uh, gaming, um, how do what's your take on um, sort of uh, fandom as a, a general term and, and just um, internet fandom especially as a, a place that facilitates this sort of um, phenomenon of people being dissatisfied or like entitled to things in relation to the, the, the things they're fans of and how that kind of becomes a pipeline of maybe uh, the, the manosphere itself. Like, Yeah, yeah, no, okay, great question. Um, uh, ah, okay, so where do I start? Um, so Gamergate, it's, just, it's great to see the case, a, a sort of young person who still remembers Gamergate, actually, because I didn't realise what is this, like, sort of almost 10 years ago or something, but um, not, not quite, but... Um, well, this, the first thing is that you're absolutely right, and I actually didn't realise this link in my own sort of like sort of developing work because I used to be going like, oh, I did this game of stuff and now I'm trying to do this stuff. But um, you're absolutely right that there's a pipeline there over time and still where um, uh, and there's also a shared kind of language between the kind of gamer communities going into some of these communities. So, like, for example, the, the notion of the NPC which is used in alt-right discourses was, you know, it's from gaming. Um, and it was from a lot of these kinds of like game, you know, subreddits and like 4chan and so on. I mean, we need to keep in mind that 4chan, which is seen as this horrible place, it it it, it gave birth to internet culture as we know it. Like the memes were invented in on 4chan. They just so happened to have been most effectively harnessed by right wingers for whatever reason. But um um but so yes, uh What's my take on Gamergate? Um, well, my take actually, I'm I'm going to steal my take from a wonderful paper, and I can't remember the name of the scholar, but it's in the journal called Games and Culture, um, and they had a really nuanced take on Gamergate. So uh, first and foremost, we need to understand that Gamergate was, as you obviously would know, was kind of the, uh, the catalyst for a sort of a mass of kind of like uh, sort of, you know, violent, um, sort of language and, and and harassment of female figures within the gaming community. Um, I don't know if other people know how much they know about this. The justification, it, it's such a complex thing. So but the first thing we need to know is that whatever, however you define it, it did result in massive uh, harassment, nastiness and violent uh, discourse directed towards women uh, in the gaming community. Um what it was the the catalyst for it was this guy who got dumped by his girlfriend who happened to be a game designer um and he went on 4chan i think and sort of said that oh you know started like bad mouthing her saying that oh she was sleeping with journalists to get good reviews for her indie games um and this so this was obviously a misogynistic you know you know guy from a sort of loser ex-boyfriend or whatever who and he basically he had to retract that eventually um but anyway, so this then transformed into, oh, look at the kind of bad ethics in this space between designers and journalists, you know, that they're in cahoots with each other for, for good reviews and, and paying them off and so on. Um, and that then mutate, and that was used as the justification for all sorts of kind of misogynistic stuff that was directed mainly towards, directed towards female de uh, designers, uh, developers, and, and other figures like uh, Anita Kasich, um Nina Sarkeesian, sorry, it was a big YouTuber at the time. Um, but anyway, what's not always acknowledged in that, that there was a genuine um, growing uh, concern about journalism ethics in gaming that preceded that. 
And a big example of that was um, there's a big uh, site called GameSpot who ended up firing one of their journalists about a year before because he gave a bad review to a game that uh, the the studio who'd made it had given the site piles and piles of money to advertise this game. So they had this funny situation where games called Pain and Lidge 2, I think, and that they, they had all this advertising for this game on GameSpot and then this review that it was like four out of ten saying it was really crap. Um and then he got fired and they they kind of gave this kind of disingenuous thing. It's like, oh, it has nothing to do with this. But it was clearly evidence of something that it, that was genuinely there, which was that as this was becoming a bigger industry, more mainstream, there were real problems with journalism, with the journalists and 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 their relationship with these developers and these studios and how they were, you know, were they actually giving. So that was in the background of this thing. And the other, so, but anyway, so the paper's argument, I think this is fair to say, is that, this is intensified by decades of essential demonization of gamers and particularly uh, young men and boys who game. You know, back in the 90s, you know, games were going to turn them all into mass shooters. Uh, it was all sort of like, you know, mental illness and all this stuff. And so there was that there as well, which made the community very defensive and ready to lash out. So when Gamergate happened and it had there were genuine issue, some of the anger there um, and the way that it exploded was a range of different things. It spoke to the kind of the hegemonic masculinity of that community, but it also spoke to this longer term kind of demonization of gaming and this fear that, you know, these, all these forces were coming from outside and trying to sort of mess with their hobby. It spoke to a, just a genuine and legitimate issue with ethics in gaming journalism. Point being that it was a much more complex sort of thing um, that, uh but again, you know, in saying that, you need to say that without somehow sort of hiding the very important outcome of that, which was misogynistic uh, abuse online and so on. I, is that helpful? I don't know. Oh, and fandoms. So, yes, yeah, sorry, quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm I'm a bit – so, I mean, I need to give my um, – I can see people wanting to leave this room today, but feel free to go whenever you want. Fine. Um, so I, I need to give you why I don't like the word toxic first. I, uh, it's reductive um, and something like hegemonic masculinity is perfectly fine and much more uh, sort of useful framework anyway. But it also, in medicalizing and turning it into a sort of disease, and it's not just a metaphor, it's a metaphor that becomes sort of like we, we think of it in terms, we think of these kind of bad masculinity practices in terms of a kind of a toxic thing. That actually takes it divests boys and men of agency in their adoption of these views. Um, so when you say that a boy is toxic, um, a it's this boy is going to infect others, and somehow this boy has succumbed to some illness rather than making active choices about what he wants to believe and, and so on. So that's the one reason I don't like that. But you see it applied to fandoms as well, toxic fandoms, um, and I you know. Like I'm a big Star Wars person, and um, those Star Wars sequels got increasingly bad, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, ending with the third one, which <laughs> this is open to debate. Ending with the third one, the, the second one was kind of interesting, but you know, I think a bit flawed. But the, and the first one was yeah, just like that a, was sorry, yeah, that was definitely for me um, as also as kind of an ex Star Wars fan at this point, <laughs> but, uh, mainly because that was. One of the first run-ins with the whole um, community that would uh, that we nowadays would call the manosphere, like back then, yeah, it's yeah, no, and they're pi these are pipelines and they're all overlapping sort of things. But um, but anyway, my point was with the Star Wars thing is that if someone's loved Star Wars and was just deeply disappointed by where Disney took that took that franchise and has sort of just really sort of like over overdone it or whatever, it's millions of things of mediocre quality. There's a you know. That's the, the fandom that have pushed uh, that have not liked that does absolutely include um, sort of racist fans and sexist fans who are sort of decrying the diversity of the thing. But it also includes, uh, you know, proportions of people like me who just didn't like the films and didn't think they were very good. And what I what I get concerned with is the way that toxic fandom has is being used by extremely large, powerful corporations to essentially silence those of who, people who just don't like their films. So 
you know, and sometimes I'm kind of apprehensive about saying, oh, I'm sorry, but I just don't like The Last Jedi. And then it's suddenly like, oh, my God, is he is he a misogynist or, you know, or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, have a, I have a problem with the idea that fandoms are sort of dangerous sort of thing, you know, the, the, you know, and also I think it kind of it hides the complexity of why people don't like a lot of the kind of like reboot kind of culture that's going on, you know, with things like Sony and Disney and, and so on. Uh, I have a yes. I also have a bit of an organizational question, so maybe not to the um, to the lecture, but, but uh, to Mr. Bartosz. Um, I'm sorry, but we have it, to finish. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, kind of... I know, but I know, but this question is just like the, the the last thing that I want to like organizationally, in terms of this being like an open lecture. So yeah. for I just want to make sure for those of us online, uh, if we just like make a, a screenshot. Uh, all, uh, where there is our name, the name of the lecture, and you know the the the, uh, the time, then just sending it will be okay. There is no need for like a I don't know for for, for a signature or anything like that. Or is there any a need for oh, anything else? Oh, talking about the open lectures, right? Still stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. That that'll be fine. Yes. Okay, and just making also the uh, written like uh, yeah, review of the lecture. That's right. Okay. Yes. Okay. 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 Uh, thanks, thanks, guys. Though. Uh, it's time for you to go to um, Marcus. Thank you very much for this thrilling uh, talk and very timely talk too. Um, it's an amazing uh, subject which I'm also quite invested in. Um, um, so thank you for that and thank you again for uh, accepting my invitation. And well, let's stay in touch because we are doing something together. Um, yeah, yeah. Fingers crossed on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So have a good day, Marcus. Yeah, and you too. Thanks again. Bye. They are. Uh... Guys, what can I do?